The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The basic concepts of reachability, uh, talking about how we can represent reach sets in continuous spaces. Then Giovanna is going to take it over and talk about some applications uh, in robust motion planning. And then Gerardo is going to talk about how we compute reach sets and focus on these two on closed loops and funds. Okay. So reachability is a task of figuring out what states a dynamical system can possibly reach or be at at a certain time. So for example, if we have these two uh, these two systems, we have a finite state machine, a discrete system, and a continuous system, and these are the starting states. Then, uh, and, and these are our actions. We can move east or north here, and we can move east or north with these velocities over there. So, after one second or one time step, uh, we can be in either, either of these two states, or we can be anywhere in this area. And after two seconds, after three seconds, and so on. Okay? So this is what reachability does. And the motivation for this, uh, one of the applications for reachability is uh, for verification. Verification is just the task of making sure that uh, we are never going to reach any bad states. So for instance, let's say we have a microwave. A bad state is the microwave being open and on. We want to make sure that these bad states are never reachable. So what we do is we compute the reachable sets, and we check for intersection with the bad states to see if, we, if the microwave is on and open, or like over here. Let's say we have these obstacles. Let's say we have a wall or some other obstacle over there. We want to, this is bad, right? Because we can reach this state, and it's the same as a wall. OK? Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, another motivation for reachability is for robust motion planning, that we're going to talk more about. And I have a video on this. So, what we can do with reachability is stuff like this. So this is done using flow tools, which use uh, reach sets, which really. Um, Gerardo is going to talk more about this example. Okay. So now, before we talk more about these cool examples, let's just formalize concepts. Let's uh, let's define some things. So let's go back to the same uh, system that we had earlier. This state machine. Uh, we have a, set, a finite set of states x, a finite set of inputs u, which in this case are east and north, and a transition function, and let's say this is just deterministic to keep things simple. And we have a set of initial states x0, which I label as red. So the reach set is defined as the set of states that we can possibly be in at time t. So more formally, there exists a sequence of t control inputs that will take us from this initial state to the corresponding reach state. So let's say, for example, we have that state. Uh, it's in the reach set at time 3 because there exists a sequence of three inputs. In this case, this is one such sequence. There's two more uh, that will take us from the initial state to that. Okay. And then the reachable set, reach set, reachable set, uh, is defined as the union of all reach sets for time less than or equal to t. So the reachable set at time zero is just the initial set of states, and time one we have the union, and so on. Okay. So the reachable set is what we use to test for intersection with bad states, because that's all the states that we can possibly reach at some, uh, from time zero to time, sometime, okay? 
Now, as some of you may have figured out by now, uh, there's a simple way for finite state machines so that we can compute reach sets. Uh, so, for example, let's say we wanted the reach set of time 2. Uh, one way, uh, the easiest way we can do this is to break this up into time steps, into single time steps. So instead of computing it straight for time two, let's first compute it for time one. And now we can use these two states as the set, it, set of initial states and compute uh, the reach set for one more time step. And that gives us the, this reachable, the reach set. Okay, any questions? Okay, and the reason why this works is because reach sets are semi-groups, and semi-groups uh, satisfy this equality. Uh, so we can we can not just break it up in, into single time sets, we can break it up into any uh, two times, S and T. Okay, so all of this was for finite state machines, uh, but for continuous systems, things get a little more complicated. Uh, it's a lot of the same concepts, but uh, we need to handle a very important issue, and that is how to represent reach sets, or just sets, regions in space for continuous systems. Because in a finite state machine, we could just enumerate the list of states in the reach, in the reach set, or reachable set. In a continuous system, we need some other way. We can't just say it's every, every point for which there exists a, a a sequence of control inputs because that can be that can be infinitely many points. Uh, so what we do, we have two types of um, representations that we like. One is convex polytopes. Uh, that's just the generalization of a convex polygon into n space, into uh, n dimensions. And we have two basic ways that we can represent these convex polytopes. One is with a list of vertices, like this, a, b, to f. Uh, okay. And then the, <coughs> the convex polytope is defined as the convex hull. And in case someone is, uh, doesn't remember what a convex hull is, let's say we have just a list of points. The convex, the convex hull, imagine you have a rubber band, and you're going to stretch it up and then let it go. And what that's going to do is this. And the convex hull is just the <coughs> whole area inside inside uh, this the rubber band. Okay? And then another way we can represent a uh, convex polytope is with a, with a set of inequalities. So for example, here, we have four lines. Uh, here's the equation for each line. So Let's say this red line, uh, we want anything below the red line. Uh, this blue line, we want anything to the right, so anything greater than, and so on. So this area is just the intersection of all these inequalities. Okay? And uh, each of these uh, representations has an advantage, an advantage over the other. Uh, vertices are good to test for emptiness, because if uh, with the, our set of vertices is empty, then our Convex polytope is going to be empty. And uh, these inequalities is very useful for testing uh, membership because for any point we can just uh, plug it into every inequality, and if it's true for every inequality, then it is in the polytope. Okay? And convexity, uh, I'll just uh, explain it briefly. Uh, convexity means that any two points inside our region. Uh, our region is going to be convex if for the line connecting these two points, all the points in that line are going to be in the region. So here you can see that this is convex, and here uh, this red area is outside the region, so this other region is non-convex. And convexity is going to be important for the algorithms later on. Uh, Gerardo will talk more about them. Okay. Uh, other than convex polytopes, we can also use ellipsoids to represent reach sets. So ellipsoids are just the extension of ellipses to n spaces, n dimensions. <laughs> and the convex polytope is defined by this. Uh, X is just all the points inside the polytopes, inside the ellipse. V is the center. And A just tells us about this, how uh, deformed 
the ellipsis. Okay, any questions? Uh, and one of the reasons why we like convex polytopes, why we like ellipses, ellipsoids, is because of their closure under linear operators. So let's say we have P that is a convex polytope or an ellipsoid. Then if we have an, a matrix A, then A times P, which is defined that way, is still going to be a convex polytope or an ellipse, ellipsoid. So if we have something like this, then this can maybe get informed, but it's still going to be convex, uh, convex polyp. Uh, and the reason why this is nice is that if we have a linear system like this, defined this way or this way, <coughs> and then if we start with a basically if we start with a convex set of states, then uh, where our rich sets are always going to be convex because we're just multiplying by A. Um, and this is very nice to represent. This tells us that our representation is going to be good, because we can just use convex polytopes, ellipses, and stick with those. And just take uh, uh, OK, and so even though the rich sets <coughs> might be convex, the reachable set might not be convex. Uh, but it will always be a union of convex polytopes or ellipsoids. Uh, for example, let's say in the previous example, we started here. Then we, after one time step, we were here. So these are two things. And then our reachable set is the union of both of them. And this is clearly not convex. Uh, but it is a union of convex uh, polytopes. So we can represent everything with the union. Okay. Uh, any questions before I move on to Savannah? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now that you have understood what reachability is and like how to represent reach sets, and before we dwell into more theoretical aspects like how to compute reach sets, but there are some cool applications of reachability. So there are many applications of reachability to to robots and like complex systems and systems. systems. One of the applications is, as we talked about before is like robust motion planning. Usually the idea is to like move a, a glider or an airplane through to lots of obstacles even in the presence of uncertainties and disturbances. You don't want to crash any of the obstacles even when there are like disturbances. Uh, there's also applications of reachability to control complex systems like uh, bipedal walking robots. Uh, here you can see that we are controlling a robot to the shape of soft water or something. And more importantly, reachability is like used for verifying safety properties for like safety critical systems like aircraft collision avoidance. So in this lecture, we'll go into more detail about what are the applications that is robust motion planning. Uh, if you're interested in other things, there are papers in the references that you can look at your so the goal of motion planning is to find a set of control inputs that take you from like a start state to the goal state. So in this example, without without colliding with any of the obstacles. So here this is like one possible path from the start state to the goal state. Uh, so it this looks nice, like it doesn't collide with any of the obstacles. And but if you get the controls for this path and then give it to a real robot you might find it going doing something like this. So this is because uh, the part that you, the uh, algorithm that you use for planning this part is does not take into account any of the uncertainties in the environment or uncertainties in the model. So there are different kinds of uncertainties. Uh, one of them is environmental disturbances, like there is wind here, so that can move you over off your plan part. And they can be modeling errors, the model that you use to represent your complex system might just be approximate. So the real world is different. And there is state uncertainty, the, your, the things that you use for measuring your position or velocity or also like approximate. So there are uncertainties. Moreover, there can be some randomness in the initial conditions. So you are thinking of starting a robot at like 0, 0, but in practice you might actually be starting at like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,
there was randomness in the initial function. So the goal of uh, robust motion planning is to is to have some guarantees with some confidence that the system will reach the goal state without creating any of the obstacles, even in the presence of these uncertainties. So this is the problem. So let's look at some of the solutions that have come up for solving robust motion planning. So this is a timeline. So there are three different systems that all of them have a core concept where they kind of use some representation to 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 represent the real set, so a set of possible states that the system can be. And then instead of searching for a single trajectory through the state, they search for these representations. So, <coughs> so that like, if you find a set of representations that can go from the star state to the goal state, you won't hit any of the obstacles. So, so earlier, uh, Bradley <coughs> and Sao and Frasoli came up with this concept called the flow tubes. It's, it's a way of representing the real sets, and you will learn more about this later from so what a flow tube basically is, is like you have a set of initial state and you have a set of goal state. So a flow tube is like a combination of all the possible paths that can take you from any point in initial state to any point in goal state. So this is kind of representing all possible places you can go to So then like you search for this flow tube to be a path to get your motion plan. And in 2006, like Optimal and Williams combined this flow tube for temporal constraints so that you can also reason about complex systems that require spatial and temporal coordinations, like the, the walking robot that you've seen before. And, and there was also work by Raster Riggs group about, um, about using funnels for motion planning. So funnels is also a similar concept to flow tubes. Uh, it's kind of like like a stability region around your path, so that if you are inside the funnel, you're guaranteed to be inside the funnel. So in this lecture, we'll go into more details about motion planning using funnels. And again, there are references for the other papers that we can look into. So what's the idea of using funnels? It's like for every path, you complete, you complete some region around that path, that's like a stable region, and that's called funnels. You can learn more about how to complete funnels later, but for this, uh, for this part of the lecture, we'll assume that we know how to compute funnels. And then you'll see uh, how to use these funnels to do motion planning. So the previous example, you see that the is the funnel for that plant part. You see that it collides with our tree cells, what a stable part. Uh, the other thing is like these funnels are a for some uncertainty model that you have. You need not know everything about your uncertainty that are present, but like some boundary more of it. And then you compare a funnel for that. Any questions so far? Can you please say again that measure of funnel? Uh, so it's kind of some invariance around invariant path around like, a, like you have a path and like it's like some invariant region around that. So I think Gerardo will explain more about it. So. The, the thing that you have to remember about funnels is that if you are inside the funnel at a point, when you exit, then like you come out of it at some time, then you will still be inside the funnel. So, it's like, do you want to explain that? Uh, yeah, the other Alright, so, um, so a funnel is basically, uh, it's, it's kind of like a reach set around a certain point. So usually the way that you do it is you have some nominal trajectory, and then at each node point in that trajectory, you can of some kind of reachable set in, at that node point. And so you blow it up and it becomes some kind of ellipsoid. And as long as you're within that ellipsoid, no matter what disturbance you get, you're going to go back towards the nominal path. And then so when you join all of those ellipsoids over the trajectory, then you get a certain kind of funnel. And as long as you're inside that funnel, you're going to stay on that funnel and you're going to be on the path that you want to be at with some disturbances, but you're going to stay. Uh, so that uh, the great thing right there would be as long as you're in the funnel, you're going to stay in the funnel, basically. So is this considered uh, uh, the control, or is it only the dynamics? Uh, it's the dynamics with the control, so it's the closed loop system. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll learn more about those like you don't like this. Okay, let me just quickly add. So, so a funnel is a type of flow tube, right? I mean, just different people either use the same terminology, use different terminology. Like each of the applications of flow tubes has some invariant, which is different. Right, and the particular invariant on this one, right, is that if if you 
are in the uh, file and you apply in our LQR component, right? It's already done, then you're guaranteed to stay within that tube. But I thought the flow tube is actually like getting smaller and smaller in the bottom. But this one is like getting larger and larger in the bottom. Uh, not, nece not necessarily. In general, flow tube is simply a, a bundle of trajectories which, which capture some common feature. And then maybe that they move to a limit cycle, and maybe mean that they stabilize to a point, and maybe that they move to a goal, and maybe that they always maintain their state within the tube. In a funnel, they focus particularly on stability to disturbance and staying within the tube. Okay, so that's a good example of <coughs> kind of useful to, to combine feasibility with motion planning. So, so here is another situation where you're trying to go from the side of the motion and then you have a set of trees lined up. But there is a part that goes in between the trees. Um, this part looks kind of risky. It's very close to the two trees. But there is another part that can take it around all the trees. So, so intuitively, the first one seems risky and the second one seems like safe, but maybe that's not true. So that's why we need to combine reachability with motion planning. So if you combine that, you might find that the first part, if you complete the flow tube for the first part, it's kind of, it does not get any of the trees and it's indeed safe. And it might happen that for the second part, it's like more susceptible to, to the disturbances and you can actually indeed go and crash the tree. So, that's why you need visibility analysis and what you combine with motion plan is what's intuitive is not actual. Okay, so, so far it's all about offline planning. So we assume that we know everything about the environment, like where the obstacles are. But that's not always true in the real world. So you do not know all the obstacles beforehand, you get to know them as you move through the space. So one problem about doing online planning is that you cannot do any expensive computations to your current time. And all of these final calculations are like very expensive. It requires like solving an optimization problem and takes like a couple of hours to finish them. So you cannot compute funnels on the fly. So the idea here is to like compute the funnels offline, compute like all the possible funnels from the start state to the end state, and then use this library to as you move through the space. Like, so so you are the same state as you going to the start state and the goal state on that end. So like we have like set of possible paths from the start state to end state and like for each possible trajectory you compute the funnel. And the idea of online planning is to now find a sequence of these funnels that you can compose that takes you from the start state to the end state without being with the obstacles. So an important component here is finding a sequential composition of funnels. Any questions on that? So, so why plan? <coughs> you're doing a forward search <coughs> with funnels. Why use funnels instead of something like RRT? <coughs> uh, I actually don't know what RRT is. So, Do, uh, can right. you guess at the answer? Why? Kind of thing. Uh. Why use funnels instead of RRTs? Well, or why use funnels? Or uh, well, as opposed to anything else? I guess RRTs, you have like the classical example where you want to go through a very, well, if you want to go through a very narrow region, well, first of all, I guess RRTs are going to have a hard time finding that narrow region because you need like a point to go through that. And then uh, RRTs by themselves don't really account for. Uh, for errors, uh, maybe some extension, uh, but funnels, you can be sure that you're always going to stay inside the funnel. So this is for our process, just to make sure that we can crash. Does that answer your question? Do you want to answer it? Yeah, I think uh, what, uh, what he just said, um, you know, it's, uh, the, the point of the funnels is that they provide a control policy. The, the actual reference trajectory uh, that you have on the left is, is the motion planning. But uh, with the funnels, you get a control policy because when you start executing the motion plan, there's always going to be a disturbance. So you want a, a control policy that, that keeps you on that trajectory. And you know, there's all sorts of control policies. You, you could use simple PID controllers. They work in some cases, uh, but funnels provide better guarantees for, for complex dynamics and skills. So, so 
the idea is that like, you have trajectories and you're computing funnels around that, and then if you're using this funnels components, you compose them to find your uh, path to the speeds that you want to go. So, so, so there's, uh, so you cannot always compose funnels, like there are some propositions that are like legal and some of those are not legal. So, consider this example, like, take time going from left to right. So you have a situation where it's a funnel, like you're trying to compose like a bigger funnel with a smaller funnel. And you have another situation where you're trying to compose a smaller funnel with a bigger funnel. So, so what a funnel is like, it's like a combination of stability. So like which of these combinations do you think is like a legal composition? Or which of these is illegal? Or is it legal or illegal? I mean that like which like, which of these guarantees do you have the same thing for this one? The bottom one is actually work because where with the top one if you're at like the very top edge of the bubble, you're starting to get now and then the second one. Yeah, that that's true. So the first one is like illegal and the second one is a legal composition. So why is that? So if you're inside this funnel, both those guarantees that you will stay inside the funnel, but, but it could happen that you can go through the funnel and then you're outside the second <coughs> funnel. And after this step, you can go anywhere else. So you can So, you can <laughs> so but if you're inside the second case, after you move through the first funnel, you're still inside the second funnel and you can be to satisfy safety properties. So now let's actually look at this online planning algorithm. So this is your space that we are planning to go through. I just replace the piece with like conics polytopes. It makes the analysis easier. <coughs> so this is the algorithm that go through each of the steps one by one. So so this is online planning. You do not have all the information beforehand. The patient will know anything about the environment and you get to know more about it as you go. So, but you still have the like initial plan funnel sequence that takes you from the start state to the state. And like, then you check for any new obstacles information that you got from your sensor. So like, this was the region that you can see, and then you can see some obstacles. And you also get the current state of your robot. Like, this is also subject to uncertainty as I told you before, so it will not be exactly zero. And you check if your current funnel path collides with any of the obstacles you have seen so far. And in this case, the answer is no. So, so then you apply the control corresponding to this funnel for this particular location and time. And that takes your robot some steps forward. Then you go, go to and then up to the stuff again and again. So you again update obstacle information. If there are more obstacles here, you get the current state of the robot. And then you check if the current plan collides with any of the obstacles. And in this case, yes. So, so if it collides with the obstacles, you need to now replan funnels. So, so how do you really plan is you have all this library of funnels, so you go through each of them and then like you find one side of the funnel that 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 has um, you, you find a set of funnels that starts with your current location and that's not collide with any of the obstacles. So this is like one possible uh, new funnel sequence. And then again, you apply the controls corresponding to that new sequence. And do the loop, so doing this two or three times more. So get the position, check if, if it collides, and again it collides. So you need to it, get a new file. So like apply the control for that funnel. And then get more information. Again, it collides, so you have to design the path. Okay, so now you reach the goal. So, so this is how like the funnel plan uh, using funnel libraries. Any questions about? Can you say more about about the computation of the funnel library? So, so they generate a set of funnels which cover the complete so, space. Yeah. So it's like. Uh, there's every possible in the initial point every possible start uh, end point and so and then you can like you do not always have it for every initial state in the because like, you can compose all these other funnels so like 
if you're doing from every initial step to every, um, so you do not have a funnel that exactly starts at your initial position. Like if there is a funnel that already started somewhere, where it goes through your funnel, goes through your initial point, you can use that. So that's a truncation of the funnel. So that's what I'm doing. Any other questions? What guarantees, like, uh, if it really is an online problem, um, that you're not going to run out of a funnel, like that you won't reach a dead end, will it be adaptable enough to make a U-turn at all times, even if it, there's some like latency, it doesn't like, perfectly time it? Are there robust is that you'll always be able to find a path, even if we have guarantees that you'll always stay within a funnel? Mm -hmm. so, so are you asking what the situations are like, yeah, just because these obstacles come out of nowhere seemingly mm -hmm. that we don't have a guarantee that funnel is safe through the entire duration of our execution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's the important point. Like, I don't know if this algorithm is very awesome. I think it can be easy to get up to do fast tracking and search for the thing. Come back and do it. Even for robots that can't actually backtrack. If the robots cannot come back, or I mean, I, I guess if this like a UAV, it couldn't do that. I was saying, like, what what guarantees do you need to have about like the obstacles because it's an online setup? Right? Maybe you have like some initial information about some kind of obstacles, like you can find a path to a trajectory, like you can find a trajectory that goes from the star state plane. So it's like it's not like there was a wall here to create that you cannot go. Well, I was going to say, like, if you're if you're in some kind of collider that can't necessarily, like, a quad or a stop, go backwards, stuff like that, then you'll have funnels that you can plant backwards. But if you're in some kind of glider and you're going straight at the wall, like, there's no guarantee. You're just, you're done. Like, I mean, even humans, they make errors. There's, like, situations that humans can't dynamically get out of. So if your system is dynamically not going to be able to make a sharp enough turn or get, go straight into something, no matter how smart your planning algorithm is, no matter if you're like, there's a wall right there, stop, but you can't stop, you're just gonna go straight at it. There's obviously situations pretty much like any planning algorithm that are, you're just gonna crash. Hopefully, you're in a situation where you're not going to a wall. But if, uh, it's also that based on how far away your sensor can see, if your sensor can only see five meters ahead, then, and you're going five meters per second, you plan for one second, you're gonna have to make perfect decisions. But if your sensor has perfect information about the environment, then what seems like the initial best path may not actually be once you know the full environment. So it depends on dynamics and sensors. Any other questions? Okay, so finally I have some uh, demos showing simulations of what what copy moving through those obstacles. So, so this is the end of application. So we have seen how, how we have seen how to use funnels to do robust question planning. We have seen how to do offline planning and how to do online planning using a sequence of funnels and the funnel libraries. Uh, now we'll talk more about uh, computing these funnels and flow tubes and other kind of reasons. So. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about how to actually compute them, how to compute flow tubes and funnels generally. Uh, I'm going to give an example of what each one is uh, used for. So we had the question before, like how are flow tubes and funnels different? Um, flow tubes are... <coughs> so the easiest way is they're both some kind of way to guarantee that you're going to... their robustness um, guarantees. So say you are here, you want to be here, um, they're both going to... most planning algorithms, you get some kind of path from here to here. But say there's some disturbance that pushes you down here or something. You have done, you don't know if you're going to be able to reach there or not. What a flow tube is, is it's some kind of set of trajectories 
that will basically go from some initial states, which are here, to some goal states over here. And basically, if, it, if you're within this flow tube and you get pushed down to a different trajectory, you know how to get from here to here anyway. So you don't really care if you're pushed as long as you're still within here. A funnel, let's see. So a funnel is, say, you compute some nominal trajectory around here. Um, using the system theory and stability theory, you know that with your control inputs, you're going to stay at each of these points, and you're going to stay within here, within these circles. So if you get pushed down here, you know you're going to be able to get back onto your path, and you're going to try to converge back to your nominal path. So you have some sort of Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question. How, how complete is the funnel? It, it sort of relates to what Brian was saying. Is, um, Completeness is in like these edges? Or? Well, if, if you have a high dimensional state space, does the funnel cover it completely? Um, there's a set of funnels. A set of funnels. So, so the question wasn't about the individual funnel, oh, like, okay. but in the particular in the headers, average, right? When you generate a set of Oh, okay. Funnels, does the set of funnels completely cover the space? Uh, it depends how much time you want to put into it, generally. Um, if like if you only compute two funnels, one of them goes over here and one of them goes like here, then you're not going to be covering the state space. So it depends on how much computation you want to do offline previously. So you compute a set of funnels that's here, another one that's right here, another one that's here, and you have your big library of funnels that cover the whole space. I think I've I think I skimmed that paper, and yeah, I think it is probabilistically complete. Okay. Yeah. Alright. Um, yeah, but I mean, as far as computing where you're going to go, if you compute that path, then you should be good. But yeah, you're right. They're probably the same. Um, Alright. So, so here's what I explained. Normally, you have your optimal trajectory, but if you get pushed off it, you may not get back to the goal state. But if you have a set of trajectories that go from some initial states to your goal state, and you stay within that, you know how to get to your goal state, even if you get pushed. So, okay, so some ways to approximate flow tubes, you can use uh, some kind of polytope, which is, um, as Gabriel explained previously, as long as it's a complex polytope, you can uh, take that cross-sectional area and you can propagate it down your flow tube. You can also use ellipsoids or rectangles um, as, as cross-sections. Um, an important point is to know that they're inner cross-section approximations. So as you see here, you may this would be your actual flow tube, but your approximation has to be an inner one, because that guarantees that you're within the flow tube, but it means you may also miss some of the outer trajectories, which also, if you want to compute a better approximation, you're going to get better flow to representation. Okay, so robust planning. Um, you plan a trajectory from here to here, and that should be good. Um, but then you get disturbed. You're still within the trajectory, so you're still good. But uh, some work done by Professor Williams and uh, Hoffman uh, shows that. So what do you do when you're actually outside of the uh, outside of the funnel. Now what you can do is uh, temporal planning. So using the algorithm that we previously learned in class, you can take your goal state and uh, move the timeline back to a uh, different time. So here, this this uh, flow tube is, if you're here in a certain amount of time, can you get to here? And if you get outside of it, then you can't do that anymore. But you can just use our algorithm and uh, move back the goal time. And then when you move the goal time, the whole funnel shifts because now you're you can be over here, and you don't care about getting here at this time. You can get here at this time now. So, so then you move over, and now where you were, you can get back into it because you're now inside the flow tube again. So that's okay. So one example is a uh, humanoid footstep planning. So this takes a complex system. You have a bunch of different uh, parts of the system. You have like your center of mass dynamics. You have your leg dynamics, foot dynamics. And um, so what you're trying to do here is plan your footsteps um, uh, forward and through time. So you have your original plan of where you want your footsteps to be for different parts. So the, there's discrete things that happen in the system as we previously seen in the lecture. 
So one thing that can happen is your left foot hits the ground and then your right foot lifts off, your left foot lifts off, or your right foot hits the ground and then your left foot lifts off. So those are different things that can happen. So you have a certain um, temporal constraints um, on the system that you want to adhere by. And so as you start planning, uh, <laughs> you have flow tubes to get you from one step to another step. And that that guarantees that you're going to stay within those even if you get disturbed and get pushed, your feet can still get from one step to the other. Um, but then also with the thing that we saw in the previous slide, you can move the timeline uh, back and forth as long as you're within your uh, temporal constraints that you had. And then, so the, that's uh, those are flow tubes for the feet and that will guarantee that your feet go uh, where they want to. But you can decompose the system to also have flow tubes for the center of mass. So what the center of mass does is um, it can be broken down into separate flow tubes. So does that make sense? Um, so this was the cumulative foot step planning that we saw previously, and now you understand how the feet are planned to go to each of the blocks. Let's see if we can get a video. I have a quick question. Uh huh. You said you have like a separate flow tube for the center of mass, but aren't they really just the same flow tube in a, like a high dimensional? Yeah, space? but that's the when you decouple a the system, then you can do individual flow tubes rather than a full system like high dimensionality. Is it hard to recouple them? Like, um, how do you know that they're consistent? Once you do that? Uh, well, it, it, it still adheres to the dynamics of the system, so okay. you can uh, couple how you want, uh, how you want it to move, and basic uh, constraints, but. Eventually, like as you said, when you move your feet, your center mass is going to move. When you like step forward, your center mass is going to move. But you can add the probability uh, analysis of it. Can I make a, a comment about that? Um, yeah, there's a, a technique called uh, feedback linearization uh, that can be used to, to decompose a um, complex nonlinear dynamic system into a set of linear ones. And uh, that allows you to, to treat the, the center mass in the footsteps. Uh, separately from the control and flow through computation same thing, uh, while guaranteeing that they're all There we go. So this is work done by uh, Professor Williams' group, which is actually cool. So this is uh, the robot doing the same kind of thing on Mars now. So. Uh, it's walking on stones and playing uh, its footsteps through a pretty complicated uh, environment. Um, stones are not exactly in the path where you would normally want to walk, but uh, you can move them around as long as you're with the flu tube, you'll get to wherever your goal we'll state is. So that was uh, how to compute flow tubes and um, oh, and another way that you can also compute flow tubes is um, by learning. So you can have some kind of example move through trajectories from one state to the other and you can estimate a flow tube based on where the trajectories are as long as the flow tube encompasses all the possible trajectories. Which is possible. Uh -huh. so, is the dynamics always linear? Because I thought like if you're uh, and if you like kind of if you're complex polytope and you like use a nonlinear dynamics and you move a little bit then you can not be in a complex shape, right? Um, um well you can plan nonlinear systems too, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm not really sure you have to mess with it. Uh so um yeah, the, uh, the polytopes generally require linearization of the system and there's a limit to uh, the validity of the, you know, the range of the linearization, and that's included in, you know, that's one of the things that limits the size of the, uh, the polytopes. But it, but it is the case that, I mean, it's kind of the standard thing that you do for nonlinear systems, right, which is piece, you're making them piecewise linear, but you are, you are linearizing them at a heavy step. And there's other techniques that people have developed with flow tubes where you do require the input system to be linear. Right here, it can be not linear, but it's an approximation. Um, okay, so funnels, the um, goal is basically to find a region that guarantees your safety under a bounded uncertainty. Um, 
So there are uh, regions of finite time variance throughout all time during that trajectory that you define. And um, so in practice, uh, there's a trade-off between computation time and guarantees. So if, you're, if your trajectory, if you compute more nodes, then you're going to be able to fill in these little gaps uh, between each of the ellipsoids. Whereas if you lessen them, it's going to take less time to compute each ellipsoid. But it's also going to not be as guaranteed. And this is especially important when planning. So if you're planning in some kind of point cloud, then some of the points may be right here where one ellipsoid doesn't intersect with the other. And you might think that's a safe path, but actually it's not at all. Yeah, so an example is this little glider, which is uh, given in the paper by uh, Ani and Russ. And um, so what you start doing is you create a uh, the, your system, your function, and this is dependent on your state, time, and W, which is uh, some kind of bounded uncertainty. And you choose the bounded uncertainty, which means that um, uh, you choose some kind of reasonable um, estimate of how much uh, can happen uh, to your system that you didn't account for. So you start, um, uh, your velocity can be different from what you want. Say your nominal velocity is 10 meters per second, you can have some kind of drag or you can have some inconsistency in your motors. And so what you expect is that there's a plus or minus 0.5 meters per second to your nominal. So when you start writing your equations, um, this is what you expect your robot to do. And then uh, that can vary forward and backwards depending on what your actual velocity is. But then you add some kind of wind on your system, which um, some kind of cross-sectional wind in the x-direction, which we see there. And uh, so what that ends up doing is pushing your system uh, away from where you want it to actually be. So now you have some kind of um, some kind of velocity uncertainty, and you also have a wind that can push you one way or the other. So how do you deal with that? Um, well, you start with your nominal trajectory that has a plane flying perfectly straight. Everything, there's no uncertainty, everything is deterministic, and it acts like you want it to. Um, so, and then, um, so right there, the wind hits it. So what do you do? You have to uh, have some kind of control, uh, some kind of controller to bring you back to your nominal trajectory and try to control you around the system. Um, so a standard way to do that is to make, uh, to have a cost function and create your optimal trajectory. And this is uh, this cost function basically it kind of mirrors a LQR controller. Um, and by solving all these equations, which is a pretty standard process, and you find out how to do that, you get a controller that uh, tries to bring you back to your nominal trajectory. And so you get back. But you don't have any guarantees uh, just with the controller. You don't have any guarantees on how far you can get pushed. You don't have any guarantees on where you're going to go and where your system can be pushed to. So, um, so when you compute uh, the funnel, what you do is you choose a Lyapunov function. And um, I'll explain what that is in the next slide. Uh, and you try to minimize the space around that function and try to bring it back. So what this is is. Um, so you have some kind of uh, your initial state, and um, right, I guess this would be the initial state. And the whole region, you, what you're trying to do is minimize it um, around it. So does that make sense why you do that? So your trajectory is basically going to go anywhere around here. And what you're trying to do is find the region of space that minimizes, uh, that encompasses all of the places that your, uh, that your uh, system is going to get to. So that's easy to do when you draw it out and you know exactly where your system's going to go. It's easy to just shrink your ball around it. But how do you actually compute that? Um, no. No. Yeah. Okay. So when you have that for each point in the trajectory, you know that you're going to stay within here because you're going to have some kind of, uh, from your nominal trajectory, you're going to have different places where your system can go under the given conditions of velocity and um, and wind uncertainty, you're going to go anywhere within that. But as long as you know you're still in that ellipsoid, then you're going to stay within those ellipsoids as you go down your path. Does everybody make sense? 
Um, okay, so the reason they use uh, Lyapunov functions is uh, there's different ways to measure stability. And um, so, I'll move over to this. Uh, so there's different ways to measure stability in a uh, nonlinear system. So in a linear system, you're either unstable or you're globally exponentially stable. So you're going to converge back to your uh, to whatever stability equilibrium point you have at an exponential rate. Um, but there's also in nonlinear systems, there's global exponential stability, there's asymptotic stability, and there's stability in the sense of Lyapunov, which is what we care about. So the difference between that is so. Say this is your nominal, and uh, globally exponentially stable means that no matter where you start, anywhere on the board, you're going to be converging back to this equilibrium point at an exponential rate. So that's the best case scenario, that's what you want. Um, asymptotic stability means that you're going to be going from uh, somewhere on the board within a certain region back to this nominal trajectory, but it doesn't have to be an exponential rate, so you can do something like that as long as eventually you start converging back to it. And then there's um, and then there's stability in the sense of Lyapunov, which is, so say you're here, your system can be doing anything, anything crazy, as long as it stays within some certain thing, which in the 1D case we saw was the little ball going around it. So imagine there's like, a ball for each of these, and this is where your trajectory can possibly go. As long as it stays within that, you can say your system is stable in the sense of layout and off. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, so knowing this, does that? Yeah. I just have a, a basic question. So um, uh, the Lyapunov function is around a, uh, a stable set point, but the trajectory has non-zero velocity. So what is the, the, you know, the point that it's stabilizing around? Uh, you can stabilize around a trajectory, which is what, um, which is also what the uh, a funnels do. So you have your little point here, and this is your nominal trajectory, some kind of state. And your wind can knock you this way, your velocity difference can knock you this way or this way. But as long as you're still within that, you gotta converge back to it. And this is um, so this is the value of your Lyapunov function, and these are the different states you can have. Um, an important thing to notice is the uh, the derivative is uh, negative definite or negative semi definite in this case, um, and that means that basically your your all your trajectories, no matter where you go, they're going to be going down this cone, and eventually they're going to go down to some value. So does that make sense? That's like pretty advanced nonlinear system stuff. But cool. All right. So once you know that, uh, it makes sense to use the Lyapunov functions as candidates for um, <coughs> for computing funnels. So um, so an ellipsoid is actually defined by a quadratic Lyapunov function, um, which down here, as uh, <coughs> previously shown, the the equation for an ellipsoid is uh, minus sum v times s. So that was the equation for an ellipsoid that Gabriel showed previously. Uh, the quadratic Lyapunov function uh, has the same same structure, where you have this being uh, x tilde, which is basically the error of your state. So it's uh, some kind of uh, x hat being uh, the state that you're actually in, minus uh, x zero, which is the nominal point that you want to reach. So this defines the region around your the nominal point, which would be somewhere in there. And the ellipsoid is computed um, by doing that minimization that I showed on the previous slides. And then you can figure out the region inside of it by solving that equation, and if it's uh, less than one, I believe you're inside. Um, and those are all the red dots which show that you're inside of it. So that's used when computing tra uh, trajectories. You solve, uh, you solve for, say that you're inside a point cloud, you know which points you're going to hit inside of this uh, ellipsoid. So when you're planning, you solve that equation for each of the ellipsoids, and you know if you're going to hit something or not. So this is a video that 
Ani did. Um, and this is using the funnel libraries for collision avoidance. This is showing for just one funnel. Um, the glider dynamics uh, were shown in one of the previous slides. They were pretty simplified glider dynamics. But, um, <coughs> uh, so you see right there that um, there's objects and uh, glider plans a path around them. Um, so the funnels, this is one possible one. Uh, right here, I'm pretty sure they tell it where objects are, even though they're not actually there. And it finds that funnel being the, one of the better ones. And you see that throughout the entire path, the glider will stay within the funnel. Um, and then when you're searching with uh, the online planning algorithm that was shown previously, it goes through all of these funnels and eventually finds the best safe one. You won't always find a safe one, as discussed. In this case, you did, but it finds the best one by um, around the path. So one way that it finds the best one is by uh, finding all of. So if you're playing a point cloud, you find all the points that lie within the ellipsoids, and the one with the least amount of points is probably going to be the safest one. <coughs> So here's a bunch of different um, obstacles, and it safely maneuvered all of them. And there's some pretty dynamic movements, which is cool too. So within that, there's well, <coughs> Algorithm. Here's one of the possible paths. You have your point cloud of um, trees, yes. and those were shown. The previous, the little brown thing with the green, like foxy tree-looking things, um, using a sensor model, you get the point cloud back, and as you're going, you plan your path. And the way that this works is every five meters, you plan a path, and then as you're flying through it, you get new sensor information, and you can replan your path using the algorithm. So, um, and that'll guarantee that you're safe. And when you're flying, obviously you don't like, see the funnels, but um, right here you can see there's probably one funnel here, and then another funnel that plans this way, another <coughs> funnel that goes to here, and then another one that goes there. And that's a full path. And there's also a cool one because it shows that you go through the tree, and that's where one of the funnels is rather than uh, going around. Is possibly you start computing a new funnel, or you start uh, searching a new library here, and you may not be able to make it out of the way in time, given what speed you're going at. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, and this is the online planning algorithm that we saw before, right now. Some of the references, um, the paper from the video that we just saw, that's uh, given here, and that also goes to the example of more death. Uh, Frizzoli's, um was uh, one of the original people that could do the flow tube. Hoffman Williams did the temporal planning for um, footsteps and decoupling the humanoid system. And uh, I, I did most of the, um, uh, the stuff uh, on the quadcopter, I did some of that. So, um, another important thing to note that uh, was a big thing in, in my personal research was that even though you may not be able to compute or that you may not find a funnel that necessarily goes, finds a safe path, you can shift that funnel around, you can move it slightly up and down as long as the first ellipsoid is still within, as long as your initial state is still within the other ellipsoid. And that's easy to do because you can just give it a simple um, 
uh, transformation between one state and the other. And if you transform this S uh, matrix, then it'll transform your entire funnel and it'll shift it around. So you can find your best funnel, even though it may hit something. If it was slightly shifted to the left, you can uh, you can just shift it using that transformation. So that's one of the benefits of funnels too. Yeah. So everyone understand funnels and flow tubes now. So I have a quick question. So the size of the funnel is computed by the chance constraint there, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. If uh, if you want to give it some ridiculous wind, like a thousand miles per hour, then you're going to get huge funnels. But that's under some kind of reasonable, you know, in this region of the forest or something, there's only three mile per hour winds or something like that. Yeah, yeah that's based a lot on what your bounds are. So do you have any, like, any algorithm in your mind that is like not using offline end. So this like mostly you do the offline end and yeah. online search. But if you're like in a wild environment, you know nothing. Then mm. do you have anything in your mind that is? Uh, that, I mean, there are algorithms that will well, just a basic controller will try to get you back to normal trajectory. But there's nothing that I know of, at least that'll guarantee you safety and it'll give you an all-encompassing region like a flow tube or a funnel. Because I mean, to so flow tubes you find. There's an infinite number of paths that will get you from here to here uh, with your system, basically. Like every little minute change that you have, and that obviously takes a while to compute and approximate. And the funnel also takes a while to compute in the regions where it can go. So I don't know anything that will online compute this region, but online you'll be able to compute some trajectory, and then like your controller will take your state error and uh, try to control it. But it won't guarantee anything. Uh, with the funnels, how do you uh, compute your initial set of states or the allowed initial set of states? You have these uncertainties like for the wind and, and velocity, but what about, you know, the initial state is sort of before those disturbances happen, but you probably want more than one initial state. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's some here. Oh, yeah. yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> So with the funnels, um, so, you, so you have your um, nominal trajectory again, uh, and then your ellipsoids around it. Um, so when your system starts, you have your initial state, and your initial state is just it's going to be here at time t zero. But um, over the time computed, you can go over here or anywhere over here, really, depending on what happens. But I just mean that. Um you want to apply the, the funnel multiple times, mm -hmm. and your initial state may not be exactly the same. So it should be possible to use the same funnel, mm -hmm. um, you know, even though the initial state is off by a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So say that you chose this funnel first, and eventually, like, what actually happens is you do this, and you get pushed around, and then you end up here instead of this normal one. Um, as long as your next funnel that you plan, so you can start a new funnel at any point in this trajectory, as long as the next funnel is also, as long as you have the intersection between the point and the next funnel, and if you're within this, uh, this region and you plan the next funnel, well, what you do is you plan the next funnel with this being uh, original x0, so as long as that's uh, your next x0, and then this will take you on a new nominal trajectory. Yeah, I'm just just saying, uh, asking how do you, uh, how, like for the one uh, all the way on the left, that one, yeah, how do you define how, how big that initial region is? Uh, okay, um, so that one, say, uh, if, you, if you start, say, not moving or something, and you get pushed, is that what you're asking for? Well, I, I mean, I understand that, that you're using the, the, v, the uncertainty in V and W, to, that essentially defines how yeah. big those, those funnels are. Mm -hmm. Do they also define how big the first one is? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they do. Okay. Um, so, what you're doing, because uh, what you want to do is use the funnels that have some funnel library and be able to use those uh, throughout all time. And so, you don't want to, so I guess what you're, if you're asking, the first funnel, you're going to start 
at some initial state zero with no velocity, stuff like that. And so you're not going to have any uncertainty on the first thing because you know where you start in the state. Yeah, I'm just asking, um, you know, independent of the, the wind and, and stuff like that, you might just be starting at a point other than what that nominal point is. So you may want to define that initial funnel size by some other criteria besides wind. Uh, is there? Uh, okay. All right. So the other like sense or like how sure you are about where you should. Yeah, and then, I mean, there's sensor uncertainty, but you know, you just may happen to be in the, you know, if you're doing the glider experiment 10 times, um, you know, you may not start it from exactly the same position every time. Yeah, well, you should, your, your funnel, every time you plan a new funnel, the, you start at the nominal trajectory of that new funnel. So you don't, you're not going to have this funnel, and you're, not, you're never going to start over here on the first one. You're always going to start at this point. Well, but if you, I thought, I thought the point of the funnel was so that you can reuse it without having to, to replan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you can move the funnels around. Oh, you can move? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, right. that was, um, so yeah, so every time you start a new funnel, you start at this nominal trajectory, but the next time you use the same funnel, you could be over here and just shift the funnel down okay. to exactly the same point. All right. So the initial state is never going to be anywhere starting at T0. It's not going to be somewhere other than the nominal trajectory. But at T1, it could be over here. And so you just shift the whole funnel around. And as long as your T0 starts at the new funnel, and as long as T0 is within the funnel above T last funnel, then you just shift it around. You can also like turn it as long as you can uh, multiply this S. It seems like the shifting and turning is a pretty like, <coughs> complex search problem in itself. Like, is that is that a hard problem? Uh, no, that was actually the. Uh, where did, I, where did I get rid of the slide? How about I get rid of that slide? Um, I shouldn't because that was the work that I did for the uh, Let's see how I get. Um, but yeah, there's I mean there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I did a pretty um, not very smart search where I just looked for uh, the funnels, the safest funnel being the one with the least number of points in the point cloud within uh, that entire funnel. And then, uh, let's see. oh man, I dig it. But basically what I did was find the safest funnel, and if there still was a collision, collision within the safest funnel, then I made a minimization problem as you shifted uh, back and forth. And there was a cost function that, let's see if I can bring it up. So you were doing an optimization of the online running of the... Yeah. Uh, that, was an impl that was implemented in real-time simulation, but that wasn't implemented on the actual collider as of two summer ago. So, I'll write it on the board. And you also want, I also made it so you minimize the amount that you shift it to. So you don't want to shift it completely somewhere else because um, it won't be in your path and you'll end up doing some dynamic behaviors. Like you'll be flying and then if you compute a funnel that's here that's kind of safe, when you shift it all the way down to here, your glider's going to be something crazy and that may well I guess it would be guaranteed so, but I minimized it for at least the amount of shift. Does anybody have any questions? So. <laughs> um, yeah so does anybody have any questions on Cars one? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, um, so you've given us models of bounded uncertainty uh -huh. um, in your uh, dynamics. So if, if you use probabilistic models, then your funnels start looking like uh, risk allocations. Um, is there an interpretation of one in terms of the yeah, other? I know of no, but I'm sure if you look enough, yeah, I'm sure somebody's been working on that. I'm not really sure that because I don't have done that. 
Yeah. Talk a little bit about the interaction between the, um, the flow tube selection or the, uh, or the tunnel selection and the underlying path planner. So I see you have something that's planning the reference trajectory, right, that's separate from your flow tube selection or your, or your funnel selection, and then you have to select the funnels or flow tubes that um, allow you to follow that the, that trajectory the best you can. But what if, or, or how do they interact, like say if you have a flow tube, or don't have a safe flow tube or funnel to fit the reference trajectory? Okay, so, so you're asking basically the difference between planning with uh, like a funnel library and a trajectory library? Uh, yeah, kind of sort, well because like I, I know, like the the, the checkout planner that uses like an incremental path planner, right? So the plan path or something like that, and then you have to you fit. Is it are you fitting flow tubes to the reference trajectory? Uh, you can do that offline, so you compute. Uh, they're they're called like funnel libraries, or usually they're trajectory libraries. So even computing a trajectory in real time for a fast moving uh, dynamic system is going to be expensive, and then computing a funnel on top of that is going to be even more expensive. So a lot what a lot of people do is. They the library offline for a trajectory and plan using that. But on this one, you compute your trajectory, compute the funnel around that trajectory offline, and then you search through the funnel library. You don't search through trajectories and then try to fit a funnel around that one. You just search through the funnel story. If you don't have a very good library, then you might not get a very good trajectory. Okay. Also, a cool thing about funnels versus trajectories is a lot of trajectories um, will be discretized for like, speed, so you have your nodes, and so say this is what your trajectory does, and you have node points here, and you're trying to fly past a wall or something, if your wall goes here, your algorithm is going to search these points, and it's going to say, okay, well, this is a safe path because none of the node points uh, intersect with this wall, so to fly, and you're going to go a little um, but a funnel, since you have this region around it, you, um, I did a bad job of drawing that, but no, okay. Uh, when we search um, this, uh, the algorithm and see if it's uh, less than or greater than one, you're going to find all of these points being in that region. So it also, although I guess that depends on how well you want to discretize it. If your trajectory is a bunch of really, really small points, then you're not going to run that issue. It seems like you could, like when you're building a normal RRT without funnels, uh, truncate points if you say, yeah, they're illegal. Yeah. Uh, it seems that if you're automatically adding on to that funnel instead of generating an entire trajectory and then making a funnel, you could save computational time for sites and <laughs> things like that. Do you know if that's done? Or? Um, no, I don't. Um, I do know that, uh, I mean, computa you obviously want to minimize computation time, but it's not a critical thing when computing, I guess, funnels and flow tubes, because you do that all offline. So, and you want to, hey, I don't think it's even close to the point where you get online and compute a funnel. It takes like six hours to compute so, Depending on how, how many dimensions your state has. So, yeah, it's not like you're flying and you compute one of these things. You don't crash like hours of the floor. 